Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out this morning to join us for this talk. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our two esteemed speakers today. So first up, we have Creighton. Creighton is the senior data scientist who leads the digital healthcare application team at MOHT. Uh, Creighton shall be sharing with us a little bit on how data collected from various wearables and health devices could help us keep our community healthy and also how data and digital technology could be used for preventive care space of uh, mental health. And up next after uh, Creighton, we'll have uh, Yifeng, who, who leads the care solution team at MOHT, responsible for acute care redesign and evaluation, scoping of acute care delivery issues for improvement, and piloting of acute and post-discharge care innovations. Uh, he shall be speaking um, uh, on the work that he has been doing in exploring concepts of hospital at home and um, the rationale and perhaps our progress towards decentralized care. Uh, so without a further ado, I would like to give the time to, to Creighton, uh, who would uh, share with us what he has been doing. Thank you so much. Today, I'm going to mainly focus on these three technologies you see in my title, digital health, applications, AI chatbots, and a concept called social listening, which if, if you don't know what that means, I'll, I'll uh, describe it a bit later. And I'm going to be talking about how we apply it to our mental health initiatives, is in particular, health promotion, mental wellness. Um, okay, so with that, here's a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to overview mental health in Singapore and our approach to addressing, uh, to serving mental wellness with our digital mental health platform is called MindLine SG. Uh, the platform delivers digital therapeutics, principally through an AI chatbot that's been designed for our mental wellness applications. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some work that we're tracking very closely on social listening being done at ASAR. And this uses social media data to try and model and, and, and machine learning models uh, to try and model and predict uh, mental wellness in the population level. And we've given a lot of our mindline data to help train those models. So I hope it's not too small, but to give you an overview of mental health, um, here is a pie chart showing the burdens of disease by disability adjusted life years, which many of you in this audience probably know, but if you don't know what dotties are, um, it, it's okay. I think the proportions of the chart sort of speak for themselves. So here the, and again, I hope you can see it, that it's not too small, but the largest, or if you can even see my pointer, which I'm not really sure about, but uh, the largest one is that blue one there, which is cancer. It's at 15%. The next one down is musculoskeletal disorders and so on. Um, and it's actually that fourth largest pie slice are mental disorders. So at 8% of DALI's mental disorders are actually the fourth highest burden of disease in Singapore, which many of you may know, but it may surprise an equal number of you. And um, it, it's actually, well, and we've also also found that it's underserved in Singapore. There are far fewer trained professionals and psychiatrists in Singapore per population compared to the US, compared to Australia. And this is, this is the situation in the region. And actually, this, this burden is, is not just an Asian burden. It's not just a Singaporean burden. Actually, mental disorders fall around this level of, um, of, of burden worldwide. And moreover, during the COVID-19 pandemic, as you can imagine, there was a surge in needs for mental health, uh, largely driven by things like job insecurities, isolation, not being able to travel to your family, even things like increased caregiving burdens for people who no longer could send their kids to uh, school, to care facilities, or even their aged parents or grandparents, for instance. So in order to serve this emergent need that came about, MOHT decided that they wanted, we wanted to launch a online portal that gave you links to all of our local mental health resources. So here, for example, is an early mock-up actually that I pulled out of some of our early strategy designs. And we were planning on, say, linking it to the COVID-19 symptom checker, which actually also came out of our office. And when you came here to, say, check your COVID-19 symptoms and look for places you can get tested, for example, you would also see different news items or, and also mental wellness 
resources was sort of the plan. But very early on during ideation and then early launch, we realized that there was an existing gap in Singapore. There, at the time, at least as not as far as we knew of, there was no sort of single point, one-stop shop that you could go to and find the localized resources, all the content you would need for your mental health needs. And we quickly realized that something like this uh, could serve that need broadly. So from that, Mindline SG was born. Uh, it was, was launched in June 2020. And the, the design of the platform, and I've given you a couple of snapshots here, was to be a one-stop shop for local mental health resources, generally speaking. So I put the URL up here uh, if you've never visited. If I were in person in a room right now, I'd probably poll the audience to see how many people have heard of MindLight or even visited. But if you have, it, it looks like this. Uh, in the back is a screenshot of what it looked like on your desktop and also a little demonstration of what it looked like on your phone. And I'll go through some of that content later. But again, some of the principal components of this platform are that it is anonymous to try and overcome challenges such as stigma, say. It's barrier-free, not, not just being anonymous, uh, and you can access it from your phone, but you don't have to download an app. It's a web app. You just go to the website. It's free. And also, we want it to be trustworthy. So it should come from sources that you can trust that you know the tools that you're using are likely to benefit you, um, are reliable. And so we've also put a lot of our partners, may, we have many partners who are leaders in the healthcare system, mental healthcare system here. And they're also branded on the site and, and um, have been integral in, in, in getting this thing as successful as it is now, we think. So if I may, I would describe, let's say an overarching goal of the platform is to empower users to maintain their own mental wellness. So it is fundamentally about self-care and that is enabled through digital health tools. Uh, and then to know where to find help when it's needed. So of course we can't fulfill everyone's needs and when people do need care that's beyond the competencies of a digital platform, we wanna be able to hand them over to professional services uh, appropriately. And just to give you a bit of numbers for those who like to see it, uh, in the first two years since launch, it's been about two years, the platform has seen over 420,000 unique visitors, which is about 14% of our target user base of 3 million people who we think in Singapore would access a website like this, uh, which we think is, a, is actually a very large reach for, for two years. 65% of that number, they will actually explore the site. So um, they actually, let's say, start clicking around on different things and viewing things. Uh, so that's a measure of engagement. We call it non-bounce users. And about 10% of those users return to the site. So again, getting, getting people to return to the site when they need it, um, practicing, the, practicing the exercise on it. That's, that's sort of our behavior change goals are, are, are goals for mental wellness, health promotion. So digging into some of the components on this site, it of course has links to articles and videos, local organizations like counseling centers, helplines like the Samaritans of Singapore hotline. We have also implemented a self-assessment tool that actually is in the right two panels of, this, of these little screenshots I've shown you. And that'll give you a dynamic survey of questions that you can take that help you monitor your own mental wellness. It'll give you a protocol, whether, whether things you're doing well, whether you're mild need, moderate need, or in crisis, and it'll direct you to appropriate resources. I'm going to talk about that data a little bit later that's driving the social sentiment analysis work. Uh, and then actually most of the therapeutics being delivered on the platform are being delivered through an emotionally intelligent AI chatbot that right now is being delivered by a company called WISA. And um, I'm, I'm going to dig into that in this next section. And, and I want us to forecast maybe how we could apply to other applications in mental health. So these, this AI chatbot in particular, and here I've given you some screenshots of what a conversation with it will look like. Most of the exercises are inspired by cognitive behavioral therapies or CBTs. In the mental health care, these are type of talk therapy. And they're focused around a therapist trying to identify a particular problem or a stressor with a patient. And then they try, the goal is to reframe your thoughts, reframe the thoughts, looking at the problem from a different perspective. Uh, that, that, that's the fundamental principle. I hope, hopefully I didn't butcher it. And this is delivered through dial instead of with a, with a therapist, this is now to the bird, uh, through dialogue with the chatbot. That's sort of the principle. So 
here on the left are some uh, snapshots of a few different exercises. For, for example, this one is focused around uh, steroid confidence, is about building self-esteem, perhaps. And the most popular resources on the site, actually, uh, sorry, exercises of this form are one about one called Locate Energy, and that's about resilience. One is uh, sleep hygiene. They give you a little checklist to see if you're, you have good sleep practices to encourage better sleep. Um, and these, for again, for people who like numbers, here's like the number of users who have, who have used these two different web sites, which is for these types of applications, actually quite a large number. And then finally, of course, it's an AI chatbot. So if you really wanted to, you could engage in freeform, uh, freeform chat with the bot. Now, and we, we view it as being an option for, uh, say, 24-7 mental wellness buddy that you can always access. Some people now, when it comes to AI, and especially chatbots, some people start becoming a little bit skeptical. But, but what I want you to think, if you are one of these people who are skeptical, and, and that's fine, what I want you to think about it is, uh, the idea is like, say you're here a student at the university, and you're alone at night, and you're very stressed out, and that stress is just debilitating you, and you can't work. So some people will reach out to their friends on chat for support, and that's great. Uh, some people, they're a bit more, uh, they have a bit more serious needs and they can't even reach out to friends. So they, don't, they don't have that access. So instead of going online and maybe say playing games or doing other things to re-energize, this could be one option where you start chatting with the chatbot. It starts directing you to resources to understand different stressors. And, and maybe whether you liked it or not, you might have gotten a bit more awareness out of it. You might have learned some new coping strategies that you're aware of. And, and that's sort of one of our, our main goals here. Um, so these exercises are popular. They account for over about 70% of all resource utilization on this site. Uh, and again, as I said before, we want it to be trustworthy. So uh, in, right now we're, being, we're delivering the chatbot through WISA and they have built up a large body of evidence now that, uh, it, um, that there's clinical impact, clinical effectiveness. And um, we are also partnering them right now to run imp impact evaluation studies um, for my mind, actually over at MOHT, I, I am heavily involved with most of the evaluation efforts for this platform. So now along the themes of this symposium, I want to project a little bit into the future. So let's think about AI chatbots for mental health more generally. The data asset you have there that enables this whole thing is, of course, the conversational experience. So that's chat logs. And then the methodological technology going on, going on that's utilizing that asset is AI and machine learning models. They've been, despite the recent deep learning boom, they've actually been driving, um, deep learning has actually been driving uh, conversational agents for decades. And uh, they train the chatbot to localize to different situations, to different applications, or even to Singapore itself. So if you want to project that into the future, what you want to use AI chatbots for uh, more generally in other applications, the first thing you should think about is where you're going to get that data. So if you don't have text-based or some other form of conversational data that you can train this thing, then, then you know, that's your first hurdle. Um, or you can create it. You know, so some, some people use their domain knowledge to start generating a service, and then from that, they start collecting chat data to train chatbots. So that's the first thing you need to think about when you strategize. Um, and what are the transformative potential? What, what is the transformative potential that AI chatbots have for healthcare, in particular mental health care? One is it acts as a first line response, right? Instead of having to get somebody activated to go to a, to a hospital or a clinical service, they can just go on their phone. And they, it can direct people to resources, say the AI chatbot, or it can, it, it can direct people to um, go and find permission to help. It has low barriers of use, um, which is very important, especially for things like mental health care, because there are stig issues with stigma surrounding um, its access for many people. Or even it could just not be part of a culture to, to go and seek help for, let's say, mental disorders. And then finally, it could, I'm, I'm, by the way, these first two points, we're, we're already doing a lot of this with Mindline SG um, at MOHC. But another, another use could be that it could offload some of the burden from clinicians. There's not enough psychiatrists in Singapore. There's not enough trained professionals for mental health in Singapore. So this could bear some of that weight. Um, and it also can be used as an adjunct for therapy. Let's say after you go in and see a psychiatrist, they can assign you homework, maybe delivered by these AI chatbot based CBTs. Um, and that's something that we're eyeing as our future strategy. We haven't really started touching it, but um, it's on our, it's on our, it's in our sites. Um, okay, so these are my final few slides that I'm going to be talking about. And um, if you think about it, the AI chatbot 
it's giving you a venue to express your feelings uh, to chat dialogue. And then with that data, we deliver care, we develop care strategies. And actually this is the same thing you do when you go into a doctor's office, right? Um, but if you think about where else can that data come from? Well, here's one idea. What about social media? So if you think about it, people are definitely going on platforms like Twitter and they're definitely venting a lot of their feelings. And certainly they're doing it at a much higher frequency than they do it um, on my line SG and probably you're doing it more than you even do it to your friends, I would imagine. Uh, so there's actually a lot of data out there, right, on the internet that that you that you can try and you can try and mine and you can try and develop strategies from. So this is actually what social listening is all about. Social sentiment analysis is another uh, word that's used term that's used to describe these things. And so we've actually been working, or at least tracking closely, uh, the work of an A-star researcher, uh, Dr. Yinping Yang, in particular in this case. But there are other. Oh, I'm sorry, I spelled her name wrong. It's Yinping Yang. And uh, she's a, uh, and there are other researchers, I'm sure, at ASTAR and around Singapore that, that do this type of work. Um, but they're investigating using this social sentiment analysis to try and act as a predictor for population level mental wellness. Um, this, you, know, you don't have to know about the technology, but the strategy seems pretty, pretty simple, right? You look at social media posts and you try and glean uh, a sense out of the emotion. You train AI models to, does this person sound afraid? Do they sound angry? You know, do, they, do they sound hopeful? And then you can sort of get a sense, almost like a little bit of a pulse a thermometer of the mental health of the country. So she actually has implemented a lot of these models um, uh, and used our MindLine data, our MindLine SG data, uh, particularly the results of the self-assessment tool that I described earlier. And she basically trains the models to be able to predict those uh, and, and thus expand to a prediction of, of mental health. Um, and in particular, a particular study I saw that, she's, that should imminently be published um, uh, was actually during COVID, focusing on around the time of the different COVID-19 updates, so the case numbers and policy updates. And they were obviously driving a lot of the emotions being expressed on the Twitter and Facebook and other platforms. And she was mining that data and she trained it against our MindLine SG measurement data, uh, sorry, the, the wellness measurements that we have. Uh, and she was there for, and she shows that she's able to develop a model that can take these sentiments, I've listed some up here that she generally categorizes into, predicts these four protocols, well, mild, moderate, and crisis from the self-assessments. Um, and, and, and these findings have been significant, the predictive of well-being dynamics across the population. So we find this very, very exciting. Uh, this is a demonstration and we ourselves are right now trying to brainstorm and strategize how this can be used um, for future applications. So. Um, yeah, to end this session, kind of along the themes of this session, uh, you, I want you all to think about future health. We don't, we don't know how we're going to use it. I would love to hear people give me their ideas. Um, but yeah, how do we integrate such technologies into our public health surveillance, to use the language of epidemiology, strategies to transform population level mental health care? Um, and, and I'll leave it at that. That's my final slide. Thank you so much, Great. And that's uh, very insightful. Thanks for sharing what we have been doing with MindLines and also the recent research they start. Um, so next up, we have uh, Ipo. Yes. Okay, great. Wait. Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Ipo from MOHT. Uh, I'm a pharmacist uh, by training with public health training and um, currently engaging in a series of uh, care redesign projects. Um, you just heard from my colleague uh, on the enormous potential on how data could share, uh, you know, could, could transform healthcare delivery and in, in particular, he shared about mental health uh, use case. Um, and in the next 20 minutes, maybe I'll spend a bit of time on uh, some of these ideas as well and, uh, and to give you my perspective uh, from a care model's point of view and how technology by extension, um, the data that comes along with it um, could uh, affect how providers treat patients in the future and how patients receive care. I'll probably start off uh, with a short one minute uh, video clip from a speech delivered by uh, Senior Minister of State for Health, uh, uh, Senior Minister of State uh, for Health, Gianni Puducherry, in March this year during the MOH budget debate. Uh, let's hear what he had to say about technology um, enabled care. If I may then, sir, now turn to a different issue technology. 
In response to Ms. Mariam Jaffa, as we move towards more telehealth solutions and a paper light environment with electronic medical records, clinical staff will receive training and orientation for new workflows. We agree with Mr. Yip Hong Wang that we should continue to better leverage technology in healthcare delivery and, off, and our efforts have accelerated during the pandemic. For example, telehealth, virtual ward programs, the use of chatbots, messaging, video or phone calls to interact with patients so that they can recover at home instead of in the hospital. The initial success of these programs and services has prompted us to study how we can extend it to other groups of hospitalized patients and more clinical services under a mobile inpatient care at home sandbox. We will provide updates on this in the future. It's from that video, Dr. Cherry offered a glimpse of uh, some of the emerging trends that I was talking about. And if I were to summarize from my point of view, I think they, there are several key trends emerging uh, in the last decade or so uh, before COVID. Some of these were already there. Uh, and with or without COVID, some of these trends are likely going to progress no matter what. Um, so for example, since the uh, 1999 uh, Institute of Medicine report of uh, her is human and then the 20. 2001 report on crossing the, the quality chasm, um, there was already a worldwide movement starting uh, to focus on healthcare quality and safety. And this set of conversations uh, subsequently turned into uh, the concept of, of value uh, when we uh, take it as a function of quality over cost. So there were already people talking about centered nurse about shared care, about community anchored care, um, generalist care and so on. Um, but for today's sharing, I'll probably be focusing on uh, technology enabled, uh, decentralized care and with it, uh, the data and analytics uh, side of house. So this is a diagram uh, that summarizes the three beyond strategy uh, outlined by MOH back in 2018. Uh, it described May, but the, the, the three priorities being um, community anchored care uh, as uh, described in the top left hand corner of the diagram over there beyond uh, hospital to community and then uh, value driven care uh, described by the top right hand corner there beyond quality to value and finally beyond healthcare to health which signifies the importance of uh, looking at health promotion and disease prevention. Much of the strategy um, is still applicable and relevant today. And uh, in order for us to do decentralized care, for example, and shared care well, uh, we need to leverage on technology, uh, as mentioned by SMS Putucheri uh, in his speech in parliament in March. Um, but as a, as a result of us being able to deliver technology enabled care well, um, with decentralization of care and uh, shared care, um, we will be able to de deliver downstream benefits, for example, patient-centered care. So this is another trend uh, that has picked up pace over the last decade or so. Um, and then to take all these things a step further, the resulting data uh, generated could help us uh, become perhaps smarter in delivering uh, care to our patients and at the same time, uh, find ways to improve value so that we get the most bang for our buck, right? So I illustrate my points using uh, use, using a project uh, example that uh, my team is currently engaging in. So as mentioned, um, so currently my team at MOHT uh, is coordinating and administering a national regulatory and financing sandbox for hospital at home care model. And over here in Singapore, we are calling it mobile inpatient care at home. Um, essentially, this care model aims to substitute brick and mortar uh, hospital ward uh, with home environment uh, to deliver inpatient care. So, so in order for us to do that well, um, it's not just about the care model itself, the care team, multidisciplinary providers, and so on. There's a set of technologies that our, our care providers in the front line use to deliver this sort of care in the comfort of patients' home. And also because of COVID, um, it also provided us with an opportunity to imagine this sort of care model as a potentially elastic big capacity uh, for us to um, tackle uh, future uh, pandemics or crisis um, if the need arises, right? 
So this is the, uh, another pictorial representation uh, describing the various features of uh, hospital at home or in our case, mobile inpatient care at home. So to the right-hand side of the slide, you see that uh, these are the uh, care elements or, or, or features of the, the care model. Um, to the left-hand side, the two bubbles uh, really describe the things that you would expect in a typical brick and mortar hospital walk today. Uh, when you are admitted to hospital, you have multidisciplinary care team uh, caring for you. You have 24-7 access to uh, the medical team. And these are the things that we are attempting to replicate in a home environment as well. And then the other four bubbles uh, on the right-hand side really describe the enablers to to allow the care providers to safely and effectively provide uh, inpatient care at that kind of intensity that's intended for uh, hospitalization uh, in a home environment. So things like remote uh, vital signs monitoring, wearable devices, um, connected to a command center like uh, environment or, or setup to centrally monitor the patients remotely uh, and then coupled with home uh, treatment uh, no intravenous uh, therapy, uh, investigations, or even down to imaging services or mobile radiology. These are possibilities that we have seen being trialed and tested in other jurisdictions. And right now in Singapore, we are also trying to see uh, what it may mean for us and whether or not this may provide an alternative uh, solution to us uh, continuing to build more and more hospital uh, and more physical bits in order to meet the demand of our uh, healthcare system um, and growing uh, aging population with multimorbidity, right? So in, in a nutshell, this care model is trying to do, as I mentioned, hospital uh, substitution or hospital bed substitution by admission avoidance or early supported discharge. In this case, it's actually not quite a discharge. The more accurate term is actually transfer because we are transferring patients from a, a, a brick and mortar ward to a virtual ward. Uh, to continue the inpatient treatment uh, process and trajectory, right? So these are the patients who would otherwise be physically be uh, awarded, uh, awarded inside a, a brick and mortar hospital. Right? This is another pictorial representation of how uh, the care substitution could take place. Um, and in this case, uh, we can substitute patients entirely uh, uh, in terms of the, the big days in hospital, or we can substitute partially depending on the settings and the care needs uh, on the, uh, in, the in, in terms of the clinical front, right? Um, so why are we looking at this and why now? Uh, I think the exploration into this care model really started before COVID um, came about. Uh, and we were looking at things from a healthcare sustainability sustainability point of view, uh, both from the perspective of the need uh, for beds, especially hospital beds, and whether or not we can find an alternative solutions to uh, building more physical beds in Singapore. And then at the same time, we were also intrigued by some of the findings uh, they were produced overseas that pointed to the potential for cost savings even uh, with such a decentralized uh, model of care uh, by using technology, by using uh, partnership uh, with the various service uh, providers in the private sector uh, or in the community. And then COVID really gave us the, the, the final push uh, for us to, to uh, start this National Regulatory and Financing Sandbox. Uh, functionally, I think there is a set of aspirations and some of these are really the trends that um, I mentioned in my second slide just now where um, there is an aspiration as the, the, the population becomes more um, affluent. Um, people want to be uh, treated with dignity and people want to be treated uh, uh, you know, with patient-centeredness in mind. So, so these are the things that are really also contributing to uh, the trend that things are moving away from institutionalized setting. Uh, into community setting, into home setting. And then situationally, uh, there were also some other changes uh, in the horizon from policy standpoint. Capitation is coming. Uh, the Healthcare Services Act is coming. Uh, actually, it has been implemented already, uh, but it is going to be implemented in phases. So, so some of these also present, uh, presented as opportunity for alignment 
uh, when uh, such a care innovation um, is being tried. Right. So this is a, a summary of the sites that are currently being grandfathered into the sandbox. So just nice, we have three sites across the three clusters as well. And uh, currently we are looking at predominantly gen, gen med, general medicine kind of cases. But I just want to, to highlight the last row over here uh, where I mentioned about the need for technology. Because if we still go back to the very manual processes where uh, nurses push a uh, blood pressure monitor to the patient's bedside to do uh, 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 PP monitoring and so on and so forth. It's, it's not going to be sustainable uh, for such a care model. So we will need technology. And with technology, there are other opportunities, especially from a data standpoint, which I'll touch on later. So these are just some of the very basic uh, uh, devices and, and technologies that, that were trial and deployed during the proof of concept stage. And during the, the sandbox stage, which started in April this year, um, there are more things that are currently being explored, uh, ranging from diagnostics to investigations to imaging and so on and so forth. So, so the, the, the outlook is, is fairly exciting in this area. Um, from a care model standpoint, we definitely don't want to position this as just another pilot. Um, from a care model standpoint, we really believe that there is a potential future, there's potential tomorrow for uh, such a care model in support of the larger movement of care delivery uh, being anchored in a community setting. And then obviously in the desired uh, future state, we hope that this care model can not only provide an alternative to increasing uh, hospital care or bed demands, but also at the same time can bring about some form of uh, sustainability, especially in the financing sense uh, to the healthcare system as well. Apart from uh, the point just I mentioned about um, the getting ready for that disease act uh, that PM mentioned also during his national ready speech uh, just a few days ago um, to provide the healthcare system with some, some elastic capacity so that we can stretch when there is a crisis we need to handle. Right, so coming back to the point about data flow and the opportunities associated with it, as I mentioned, the care model itself uh, on its own is not able to fly uh, without technology because it is away from a centralized setting where uh, you, have, you can have all the, the care providers and services uh, centralized in a single location. So, so when it is done on a decentralized model and when it is done in the community anchored fashion, um, you will have devices, you have gadgets uh, deployed on the ground, collecting data, and then um, and these data subsequently will be aggregated um, to present to the various data users, whether it's whether be it um, patients or care uh, caregivers or consumers on the receiving end of the care, or the care providers trying to provide care uh, for these patients. Uh, so, so these are the, the data users that we are talking about. And then with all these vast amount of data that's being collected, there's also an avenue or an opportunity for us to really analyze and, and do some sense making. This is the, the part that is still very largely regarded as optional at this point in time, but there are already a lot of people starting to look at this set of big data and, 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 uh, and trying to understand what these sets of big data can mean uh, for healthcare delivery in the future. So there are a lot of these things happening. And then in terms of a very simplistic relationship, we have data contribution uh, uh, avenues, and then we have uh, data repository, we have data access platform, and these are all interconnected. And at the center of it is data user. Currently, the way that we are defining data users are care providers and care recipients. Um, the thing that is not so clear for us at this point in time is um, what can we do if we analyze this uh, data further and, and do uh, further sense making. Right. And a word about security, and this is also something that a lot of, uh, especially if, if uh, you talk to uh, private uh, healthcare clusters or, uh, or, or public healthcare clusters or public healthcare providers, this is something that is always at the top of their mind um, because are collecting a lot of this data and, and to, to these um, uh, healthcare providers, uh, healthcare data is something that is going to follow the person, um, you no, know, throughout their, their life course. For example, um, uh, a, a, a diagnosis that was done in the past, um, 
It's not a diagnosis that will go away in the future. We will always be uh, following the patient as part of the uh, medical history of the patient. So, so for example, if you lose uh, credit card information, the bank can erase and replace the, the, the card for you. But in this case for healthcare data, some of these things is not erasable in a sense. So healthcare um, data security is something that is very tricky. And, um, and, and if you engage in some form of this data architecture or security design, um, this is something that you ought to pay a lot of attention to. And especially when you are navigating the interface between the internet and the uh, uh, private cloud or secure cloud um, that currently our healthcare systems data uh, sits within. Right. So um, again, so a closer look at the data-driven care, uh, the landscape, what I hope to just paint uh, is a picture that uh, is a picture full of opportunities. So in terms of population, it's quite steady right now in Singapore. And the GDP per capita is growing and is expected to grow further in the near future as well. And likewise for healthcare expenditures, uh, it is also growing. And a big part of healthcare expenditure in the near future will come from telehealth. And the telehealth penetration uh, is also improving uh, steadily. And in fact, um, the, the, the trend is pointing towards uh, more of an exponential kind of uh, uh, trend. Uh, we, we don't know whether it will plateau uh, soon and, and at what point it will plateau. Um, but the, the, health, the telehealth penetration in Singapore, because of literacy, because of internet penetration, because smart, smartphone penetration um, has been pretty good uh, when compared to other countries in the region. And, and because of all these things, the health tech market overview is also very bright. Um, so just now we, we mentioned about uh, the, the IT architecture. And then at the back of this is a set of um, harmonized uh, kind of uh, backbone structure. Um, and, and, and recently in the last couple of years, we have uh, clusters coming onto uh, NGMR, which is a national EMR. And then there are some other activities going on uh, in the background, trying to harmonize some of these things. Uh, and, and this will present as enablers in the future to enable uh, the data-driven care that I was talking about. So just to, this is my final slide, uh, just to uh, summarize, I think there are a lot of challenges today still. Um, especially pertaining to uh, the lack of data or system integration within healthcare sector, within the you know, among the different providers, and then the the pace of digitalization um, has also been uneven among different providers, especially those in the primary care sector, especially those uh, smaller uh, practices that are, are in the community, uh, and then there's also a big problem about data standardization. Some of the people using uh, European standards, some people using UK, some well, people using uh, US standards. Um, in terms of units of measures, for example, uh, dif no, different practices, uh, different healthcare organizations also have different uh, ways of adopting some of these standards. Uh, likewise, in terms of um, uh, data harmonization, uh, reference range standards, uh, again, this, this is uh, still a, a big piece of work and challenge that needs to be tackled. But coming along with it is also a set of opportunities where uh, we have seen uh, a fairly quick acceleration of uh, development uh, in the last two years during COVID. And then predictably uh, in the next three to five years, the growth trend will continue. And then there's also a, a lot of talks uh, about interoperability right now. And with Healthier SG, for example, um, where when the, when the regulators, where MOH is trying to, to, to move care delivery, and in this case, primary care, uh, to the community, to encourage people to do shared care, interoperability will be something uh, that will be trust into the, um, the, the, the line light or in the spotlight in the near uh, future. And the support and enablers are also in place, and these are the things that will uh, help drive uh, changes in the near future. So the government strive uh, towards technology adoption, uh, care redesign efforts. So there are so many things apart from the uh, MIC at home sandbox that I was talking about. You know, there was also healthier SG, which I also spoke about, capitation model coming on board, VDC, which is value-driven care. And then there are many, many other uh, telehealth pilots going on as well. 
So um, the future is bright, I, I, I would say, uh, for technology-enabled care, for data-driven care. Uh, it is really down to us to imagine how we can make use of the data being collected um, and how do we uh, make sure that uh, there's good data security uh, in the background and there's good sustainability of the movement forward. So um, with that, I will probably uh, end my talk here and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ethan, uh, for sharing your, your views on device can and the work that has been done. And certainly it's quite a bright future, I, I feel. Uh, quite exciting space to be going into and exploring. Um, so I guess we'll take the, the rest of the time to answer some questions uh, that the uh, audience have posted us. For the first one, uh, it's quite lengthy. Uh, there's several people in the chat that um, asked questions around um, risks. Uh, for people that are suffering from mental illness, that it's, 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 it will be right if we um, have disconnected care for them. Um, so I guess one of the questions here is that um, although uh, my lens is built up on uh, anonymity, what happens when in a chat, you know, someone suffers from uh, some severe sy symptoms, say depressive, suicidal behavior merge? Um, how does the platform manage this? Are we able to select them uh, to write ten uh, in a situation? Uh, yeah, so I, I do see both questions and both revolve around uh, the ethics of how you uh, deliver care to people who are severe, are, 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 are in crisis, say. Um, let's say suicidal ideas or, or major depression. So I regret that I did not mention it earlier in the talk, and I still apologize to a lot of who are artists who are aware of that. Uh, may I say that first, my ministry is not designed nor appropriate to deliver hair to people who are in moderate, severe need or suicidal ideation, for an example. So it, it, is, it is designed, it's meant for mental wellness. So, when a user comes to the platform and they are in, in security, I detect that one method is through that self-assessment protocol I described earlier. It is actually comprised of PHQ-9 and G87, for those who are familiar. And if, they, if the user falls into one of the moderate fear categories of either the risk race or the express suicidal ideation, which is one of the items on the mint, they are immediately directed to professional support services on the hotlines, for example, SMAC is a Singapore hotline, IMH on the hotline, uh, and that's the, the only thing that we direct them to. Um, it, when, when they enter the chatbot, similarly, they, 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 if they express this ideation, the chatbot will try to understand them for a small course that it's And if they do, then there's a need to, you know, that chatbot is not, it, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a product to my side, but it is linked tightly back into our ecosystem. So if that Suicidal ideation, for example, is detected, then again, they will be directed immediately to uh, local uh, uh, emergency services, SOS hotline again, or uh, IMH's um, resources. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think uh, that's uh, what, as much as I can say about it. Now, of course, let me try and predict the risk. There is a risk, obviously, involved with using AI chatbots, um, you know, and that's suicidal ideation. Frankly, and, and we're aware of that risk with Moisa, and uh, we try we try to strategize how to how to properly handle how to handle the situation. Thank you, Tess. Uh, this is the second one here for you as well. Um, so, with regards to social listening and tracking, uh, is there a privacy concern, or how is that data and so anonymized then used? Uh, yeah, so that one's a tricky one because uh, first of all, I, I'm not an expert at social listening. Um, but yeah, so you think about the data that's out there in the public domain, right? That you posted it on Twitter. And even if you are a researcher, say, and you want to go to a review board, most review boards actually come and give an exemption for ethical reviews or use public um, social media data, uh, actually. But if you brought in out anything ethically or, or what's the appropriate way to behave, especially if you're in authority or influence, uh, you know what? Maybe the world, I'm not really sure. Again, I have to look into this, but. Maybe the world isn't 
uh, hasn't really looked into this yet and, and sort of frameworks around it. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I really don't know. Uh, I would have to, uh, but, but in my personal opinion, again, if you're in, in a position of authority, you no, know, I don't think it's so free to review data that often people might not realize is so public and useful and useful. And I don't think you can to two craft, craft any old message you want. I definitely, I definitely feel that way, but. Thanks so much, Rita. Um, we have a little bit of time. We'll jump quickly over to Ethan, and uh, maybe this is more from from me uh, as a question, right? So, yes, so we are we're bringing um, decentralized tech to the market, uh, uh, making available by like, possible at home in time. But will there be a concern over cost? And with cost comes the question of accessibility, especially we're talking about public health care. Um, so, how does that say about What's your perspective on that? Right. So, so for this question, uh, there are two areas to unpack. The first is about cost and the second is about accessibility. So for cost, uh, from cost standpoint, based on our uh, proof of uh, concept data, the, the trials that we ran prior to the sandbox, uh, we found that uh, even as we bring the care to a decentralized setting in the community in patients' home, there were potential for cost savings and um, they were really driven by two factors uh, when we drilled down to the cost drivers. The first um, was the fact that we use technology, we use a lot of these wearable devices and so on um, to track the patients and do remote monitoring. So instead of uh, us having to send clinicians down uh, multiple times a day, for example, uh, to do things, to carry out activities, um, we were able to monitor and give instructions uh, to these patients and their caregivers uh, remotely. So, and, and, and the second part um, that we found was also the fact that uh, through partnerships uh, between the hospitals uh, as well as community service providers, um, we were able to save a lot on uh, healthcare uh, human resource. So, so we know that uh, human resources are usually uh, the number one cost driver in many industries, healthcare is uh, no exception. So um, in trying to reduce costs, uh, when we have a patient uh, landing himself or herself in a uh, in hospital bed, for example, um, whether the patient needs a three-shift uh, clinical staff um, or not, uh, three-shift of clinical staff is provided for. And then in a hospital at home model, um, we just provide one shift and then for the other two shifts, uh, we could very well use a uh, partnership uh, model to, to, deliver, uh, uh, to deliver care on an ad hoc basis uh, as the patient requires them. And apart from that, there is also another uh, significant cost uh, driver when we deal with uh, in-person or physical hospitalization, which is the infrastructure. So again, um, the hospital as, uh, as a setup, you know, it comes with a very hefty uh, set of infrastructure-related costs. And the moment we do away with it and we decentralize it, uh, a big part of those infrastructure-related costs are also removed. So with this reduction, even when we load uh, additional things like uh, consumables, you know, technology costs, wearable costs, and, and surprisingly, a lot of these technologies don't cost a lot, right? And... Um, on a per day basis, uh, when I visited Boston uh, prior to COVID, um, one of the implementations over there uh, doing remote vital science monitoring in the US um, only cost the patient about $50 per bed day um, to have all these things uh, provided for at home for remote monitoring and, and, and tele-treatment. So, so this is actually something that uh, we found that in Singapore is also achievable. And, and this is actually helping a lot uh, in bringing down uh, the overall cost of virtual hospitalization. Then in terms of uh, patient access, right, um, we also understand that this will not be a model um, that is for everyone, at least not for now. So there is a very careful process that we are undergoing right now, undertaking, uh, which is to do patient characterization and patient segmentation so that uh, if we ever mainstream this care model and this becomes a usual care uh, or standard of care, 
uh, or alternative um, model to the existing standard of care, um, we are able to more accurately pinpoint which types of patients, for example, um, they need to be uh, mobile to a certain extent uh, with certain abilities to do activities of uh, daily living, for, ex for, for example, or with a competent uh, caregiver at home. So these are the things that we are also trying to study as part of the, the, the sandbox. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what we are trying to get at right now is not a model that will completely replace the existing brick and mortar hospital. But uh, we are just trying to get at a, a, a model uh, that is able to complement the existing model of care and provide an alternative for, uh, for additional bed capacity. Thanks so much for that, Ethan. Um, we are mindful of time. It's almost, uh, we are run, almost running out of time, but hope to squeeze in just one more question for Ethan with regards to distributed care. Uh, so we have hospice centers uh, to, to discharge low-risk patients for step-down care. So where does um, you know, hospital at home or uh, MIC at home uh, fits within the existing infrastructure? And, and what about family members uh, in terms of capacity and things like that? Right. Okay. So um, there's a need to differentiate between um, this sort of discharge low patients who um, may be a frequent flyer of the hospital system. Um, these are the types of patients who are clinically stable for discharge and they undergo transitional care programs to make sure that they continue to stay well post-discharge, they continue to stay well in the community without coming back as a readmission. So these are the programs that has been around for, I don't know, 10, 10, 15 years, at least in Singapore. And, uh, and, and, and we rely on these people to reduce or the, these programs to reduce readmission rates to hospital. Where hospital at home or MIC at home comes in, it is not to replace this existing uh, transitional care program, but to provide uh, an alternative to do acute bed substitution or hospital bed substitution. So, so that um, instead of admitting when indicated, admitting patients who require inpatient care into a brick and mortar hospital, we can admit them into this virtual ward that has to be set up in their homes. So, so essentially, these are the two groups of patients that we are talking about and they are quite distinct. One is clinically well discharged, um, maybe receiving transitional care uh, programs. Uh, and, and, and they are well in the community. We don't want them to deteriorate and circle back to the system frequently. And then the other ones, uh, the other group are the patients who are acutely ill, who require uh, quite intensive monitoring and intervention uh, and adjustments to medications and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and these are the people who are actively uh, being treated and monitored. And, and these are the patients that you require uh, hospitalization. And it's just that Instead of doing the hospitalization in a hospital, we are doing it in a community with a set of uh, technology enablers, devices, and uh, data collected from these um, devices. Thanks so much, Ethan. I think that's all the time that we have for uh, this session. Thank you so much for the questions. I know there's quite a number of questions that are left unanswered. Uh, we can try to see how can we get the answers to you. Um, but yeah, we have to end the session here. So just want to give a round of applause for our two speakers. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today and sharing your insightful uh, uh, talks with us. Um, and yeah, all the best to the work that you're doing. And um, hopefully together we'll be able to transform the lives of uh, our patients and our residents in Singapore for the future. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Um, yeah, and we'll see you uh, in the next talks.